Hello everyone. The last time I was at John Ashley Sports Cars, I reviewed a very nice TVR Tuscan S. And a few particularly eagle-eyed viewers spotted something lurking in the background of that video. And a number of you asked, James, is that a Venturi? Well, yes, it was this Venturi. Now, unfortunately, at the time, this car was not roadworthy. But it is now, and I know what you're all thinking. Can you review it? Go on then. Now for those of you who don't know, the Venturi is one of those oddball cars that not a lot of people have seen and, well, to be honest, not a lot of people have even heard of. I only know of them, well, apart from my association with John Ashley, through a few video games I played when I was younger, notably Gran Turismo. It's the same reason that I know of brands like uh, Roof, or indeed Gilet, or companies like that. Uh, the Venturi is uh, pretty much a French Ferrari. I mean, if you look at it, it's kind of very obviously inspired by the 355. That wasn't a cheap car when it came out either, and it is extraordinarily rare. Uh, this is one of about 12 or 13 turbocharged Atlantic 300s in the country. Well, right-hand drive examples, shall we say. They were a bit more popular in France, but the Venturi factory during its entire lifetime produced fewer than a thousand cars. So if you see one of these, take your time to look at it because they are rather special indeed. Although from the exterior you would be right to draw comparisons with Ferrari, it is perhaps Lotus that this car could be most closely linked with. You see, this has a steel chassis made of tubular frames which is clothed in a fiberglass body. I rather like the look of it. There are bits of it that work and bits of it that don't, but the overall effect is of a proper supercar. My favourite view is when you lift this front clam up and you've just got this huge expanse of composite and these cool arches on top of the wheels. It is really awesome. And it has that most 1990s of all supercar features, pop-up headlights. Uh, this car has been very gently modified and one of the changes made is to make these lights LED so they now actually work and enable you to see at night. As you would expect with a low volume bespoke sports car, a lot of parts have been pinched from other manufacturers. This enormous wiper blade is a Mercedes item. These wing mirrors are Citroen items and you will recognize them if you're a Lotus fan because they are also the same as you'd find on the Esprit. The brakes, we believe, are a mixture of BMW and possibly Vauxhall items as well. The colour too is quite sedate for a supercar, but it wears it very well. It's a very, very metallic grey, and in the flesh, it actually looks quite textured and detailed. Very nice indeed. The car is mid-engined. This one featuring the 3.0-litre PRV lump, that's the Peugeot Renault Volvo, and it's very closely related to what you would find in an Alpine A610. The main difference is that this is switched 180 degrees. So the Alpines are rear-engined with the gearbox ahead, and this is the other way around. Uh, maintenance is generally not too bad, but there are a few jobs that do require the engine out, for example, spark plugs which obviously is not too much fun but if you're being completely honest and you are comparing it with a ferrari or a lotus of the time there are plenty of operations which require engines out on those so it's not radically different now this back end in pictures looks a little bit soft a little bit wishy-washy and if i'm honest a little bit kind of 355 replica in the flesh it looks far better and this car has a most unusual layout too now the engine is longitudinal. You would think that it'd be a transverse setup because the car does have a very useful boot here, which I'll show you in just a minute. Now the air path in this car is quite weird. I'm not exactly sure where the air gets into the engine bay, but the side scoops are not it, apparently. Now if you open up the boot back here, you will notice that there are pipes working their way all around here because the car's intercooler is here. Yeah, at the back, which is a really weird place to put it. Don't know why they do that, but I suppose that saves you having to go the whole route of charge cooling a car because that's realistically what you probably have to do if you wanted to mount it at the front. 
these lights we believe maybe Ford items earlier cars had uh, BMW items and this car is a gentle evolution so the first cars made by the company were made by what called MVS that's what they originally called before they called themselves Venturi MVS stood for Manufacture de Voitures de Sport yes that's right they actually called their company sports car maker very inventive people, the French. Those early cars, quite angular, quite interesting. Uh, the first one they had was called the something something 260, which then evolved a little bit, and they then did the 400 Trophy, or 400 GT. And now those were designed for a one make race series, and you may recognize those. They're the ones that look a bit like an F40. And they're about 400 horsepower, quite wild, quite light, as is this car. Um, a few of those were converted for road use, and then it was decided that they should do a better road car, which was the 300. And this was available in naturally aspirated, turbo, or later, twin turbo form. And if you've ever watched any videos of Aventuri Atlantique on YouTube, you've probably found an old men and motors video with a very young and uh, starry-eyed Richard Hammond driving a sort of light green example, and that is a bi-turbo. Those have a totally different engine. They're not in any way related to this completely new lump, the same as is used in the Clio V6. Uh, this car has a uh, very rare sports exhaust, which is why it's got the four tips at the back. There's actually quite a bit of room here. In fact, I would say a little bit more than I got from my Lotus Evora. Doubt you're gonna get a set of golf clubs in there, but as I don't play, that's fine. And it's considering the fact that these cars cost 60,000 pounds in the late 1990s, if you could afford one of these, you'd probably have something else to take your clubs in as well. A little fire extinguisher in here, some basic toolkits, and it's a pretty useful shape as well. There is also storage at the front, which is intended for the spare wheel, but most people aren't gonna carry that around. You just have more room up there. And it actually means that this car is very practical. In fact, this has just returned from a 2000 mile tour around France. There's a little hidden hidey hole here, which will get you access to an air filter and things like that. And if you click this, that will let you see that engine bay. I like the fact that nearly everything on here holds itself up and it does give you that feeling of a very premium car. Uh, note also that this is one of the few metal pieces on the outside of the car and for fairly obvious reasons. The turbo is sat right beneath it and does get rather warm. Now this car has had its turbo replaced but nothing really major has been done to this to enhance the performance. Uh, the only thing that should be noted is the fact that um, the turbo controller has been removed, so when boost comes on, it apparently comes on um, rather violently. But I'll find out more about that when I take it on the road. Before we do though, there's one last thing to show you. Inside, this is very reminiscent of 1980s or 1990s supercar, especially small run volume manufacturer type thing. I've just finished a stint in an NSX, and this is about as far away as you could possibly get from that. It feels very handmade, but it also feels fairly well made, considering the fact that this car was in storage for quite a long time, and that's never the best thing for these, it's actually pretty decent. Yeah, the leather needs just a little bit of a spruce up, but by and large, it's actually worn its miles fairly well. Uh, the view out is pretty decent, although you can't really see anything in the bonnet, which is a great shame. And you've got these lovely old school video dials, which do give you that same sort of sense of occasion that you'd get from driving an old Lotus. Now, I guess if you drove some of these kind of older cars first time around, there's nothing that special about them. But for me, it kind of marks it out as being something just a little bit different. The gearbox is a five speed Renault UN1 unit, exactly the same as you would find in an Esprit of the same period you could say that it is the car's weak link and if you want to make this more powerful it's certainly going to be the thing that's going to give you the most chip but thanks to the lotus community there's plenty of solutions for that there are as you would find with the lotus a few sort of cheap bits of no doubt french source switch gear in here but they blend in as well as they possibly could overall it does feel like a pretty nice place in here and it's Kind of a shame that so few of them were ever sold here by the sole importer, Nicholas Mee. You might know the name from their Aston sales, and indeed, the name is still on the number plates of this car. But enough talk, let's take it out. It's a strange one driving this car. I feel a most 
unusual weight of responsibility on me in this review because so far as I can tell there hasn't really been any English language video content on Aventuri produced in well, the best part of two decades. It's quite scary really so I am going to do my utmost to convey to you what driving this car is like because this truly is a once in a lifetime experience for me and a never in a lifetime experience for most people I suspect. The cars which I think are fairest to draw comparison with are the Lotus Esprit of which I've driven a couple and the Ferrari 355 which would have been on sale at the same time as this car. Now in terms of numbers this car compares probably more favorably with the Esprit it's more similarly priced, it's more similarly powered, having about the same amount of power as a, an S4S or a Sport 300. A little bit less than the Ferrari, you know, 300 horsepower plays 380, uh, but it is quite a bit torquier. So this is over 300 pound foot and there's a company currently selling one of these that claim it's actually putting out more than the factory quoted torque. That's 20 years on, which is rather impressive. The gearbox, I'm not getting on with too well. The throw is quite long and although I'm never in any doubt as to whether I'm in gear, it's definitely a weak link in the chain. What is however incredibly impressive is the way that this car rides. It is genuinely supple in the way that I would expect a Lotus of the period to drive. Probably helped by the fact that it has a double wishbone front suspension and a complex multi-link rear and the construction method is very much the same as a Lotus or a Ferrari of the time. What is truly impressive is quite how light this car is. It's over 200 kilos lighter than an equivalent 355 and it's a good 100 kilos lighter than either an Esprit or even the NSX and that's impressive. Real world weight figures of these cars are around 1270 kilos. That's amazing. Now the steering is hydraulic with an electric pump and it's pretty damn good. I'm going to get to sample it a little bit more in a moment but when you get up to speed it really does come alive. It's got a good weight to it and the car responds really well. There's quite a few creaks and groans in here but if I'm being fair to the little French thing, no different really than an equivalent Ferrari again. It does feel very much like a Lotus in here. In fact, I'm really reminded of my XL. Maybe that's because the XL was the same colour leather inside. And in fact, I'm pretty sure the same type of leather as well. I'm reasonably certain this is Connolly. Now, this car has actually just completed a 2,000 mile trip around Europe. And that's incredibly impressive. It's been in storage for an awfully long time, in fact the best part of 15 years and so it's been undergoing something of a recommissioning. It wasn't in need of a full restoration but the team at John Ashley have been working tirelessly to get it working right and it would be unfair to them to say that the car was finished because in their own words it isn't. There's still a few little kinks that need ironing out, the fueling isn't perfect and the turbo delivery isn't spot on either. However, it doesn't come in quite as brutally as I thought it might and the car certainly gives you a healthy punch in the back when you put your foot down. What it doesn't do is sound particularly exciting. Now it's quite interesting actually because the other cars I refer to, a 355, the NSX and so on, there's quite a bit of separation between you and the engine. But in this, a lot of the engine compartment is actually inside the cabin, so you can hear a lot of mechanical noises and clicks and ticks and all sorts of things going on behind you, which um, makes it a more complex sound, but it doesn't really make it a better sound. I'd be interested to see how the bi-turbo sounds in comparison because with its 24 valve 60 degree V6 it should sound markedly different. The PRV unit is a 90 degree V6 and I am generally of the opinion that 90 degree V6s are the work of Satan. And I don't mean like, you know, Satan when he's having a fun day, like, you know, blood orgies and things like that. I mean sort of like awkward, annoying sort of things, you know, politicians, that kind of stuff. 90 degree V6s generally happen when someone's trying to make a V8 and a V6 at the same time and they're cheaping out. The PRV apparently originally was going to have a V8 relative, but 
that kind of disappeared by the wayside. It does, however, work fairly well, and in the 400 GT that came before this, a Venturi thought that the car was good enough for about 400 horsepower. Uh, the gearbox, I doubt, would cope with that kind of power because this is a known Achilles heel in the Lotus world, and I think about 300 or so is probably the limit of what it's going to accept happily. The view out is actually very good indeed. You've got excellent visibility all round, and the shape of the car does mean that, again, the 355 is a pretty good reference. I apologise to those of you which haven't had a chance to drive a 355. If you get it, I highly recommend it, but you can see from the shape of the car that clearly this is how it's going to feel. I really like these nice wing back seats and although a lot of the stuff in this cabin doesn't fit together quite perfectly, actually generally it feels pretty solid. In fact, if you put it up into fifth and you're kind of bimbling along, the car becomes fairly quiet and placid and it is really rather comfortable. It would be an excellent touring companion, especially with that copious storage space. The brakes are very soft and need a very firm push to get the car to haul up and you can tell that they aren't the biggest items. If you were going to buy one of these and use it on track for any sort of serious work then there's something I'd look at upgrading. The good news is that I suspect all you need to do is find out where they stole said brakes from and you'll be able to find plenty of better discs, pads and everything else. turbo comes alive at about 3,000 rpm and it's interesting to note that the twin turbo version of the car doesn't really produce that much more power and it in fact produces slightly less torque but it was intended to give a more drivable car when you're in the higher reaches of the rev range it does sound a little bit better but the red line in this is not even 6,000 rpm so if you're hoping for something that screams like a 355, it is certainly going to disappoint. But to steer, it's actually really delightful, and comparisons with a Lotus and a Ferrari in that department are certainly well deserved. The more time I spend in it, the better it feels. They've even done sensible things like, although the car's got a light coloured interior, the top of the dash is black. That's not something Lotus did on all their cars, and it means you get a load of reflections in the windscreen in those. Not so in here. It's easy to see out of. It's easy to drive. It's, it's nice. Everything kind of falls where you'd want it. You've got aircon. It still works. You've got a decent stereo. Okay, that has been upgraded since the car was new, but there you have it. It's <laughs> it's a proper car. Yes, it feels like a low volume sports car from the 1980s or whatever, but it does feel special. It is really quite amazing. And there's just something about supercars that I really love. Having had the NSX the other week from Honda, there's just a feeling you get when you're driving them that is not something you get in anything else. It's one of the things that I think separates a 911 from being a supercar. I don't feel like this when I drive a Porsche. You don't get the same looks in a Porsche as you do with something like this. People don't know what this is. Nobody around here knows what this is. It was built in Nantes in France. You know, no one around here in the northwest of England has heard of a Venturi before. But they all look at it and they all go, that is a cool car. As I was rigging my cameras up, people are looking at it. And look, okay, I rig cameras up all the time. People look because you're doing that. But they were looking at the car. They weren't looking at me. What would I do to it? Well, i definitely fit a short shifter kit. Fix some of the creaks and rattles in here. Because they are fixable. They're just bits of trim rubbing against each other. It's the same sort of thing you have to do with any old sports car. It's just par for the course. And before I drove this, in my head, I wondered what the suspension would be like. But actually, being perfectly honest, it's really good. Properly, seriously good. Okay, this car can trace its roots back to the 1980s, but you know what? I keep listening to 1980s music. It's not because I love retro stuff. It's just because I like it. And it's the same with this thing. Yeah, it's an old record. But it's one of my favourites. It's just got a different flavour. Thanks for watching everybody, 
if you're interested in knowing more about Venturi's, please ask below. I'll ask the guys at John Ashley anything you want. If you're thinking of buying one of these, you want to know a bit more about them, or any other oddities, they work on Alpines, which are a close relation, stuff like Lotus Carlton's, Range Rovers, all sorts of things, please drop them a line. Their details will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.